Welcome back to the show, everybody. Beyond Recovery. Very excited about this guest. Yet another guest from across the pond. And his name is Fraser Franks. Fraser, how are you today? I'm very well. Thank you for, thank you for inviting me on that. Oh, man. Yeah, it's for sure. You, were, uh, you know what? We're just like the Instagram community is, is fantastic with the, the whole sobriety thing. I'm sure you've, uh, you've recognized that as well. And, uh, you know, I was just kind of going, getting, getting acquainted with everybody. And they came across your profile. And I was like, man, I got to reach out to this guy. Seems very interesting. You got a lot of things going on, you know. So, yeah, <laughs> former uh, footballer uh, you know, athletes, uh, writers, speaker. So lots to talk about, but, um, you know, before we get into it, uh, yeah. So you're, you said you're just outside of Manchester, right? Is that where you're calling in from today? Yes. I'm in the North of England, North yeah. of England. Yeah. And you said you bounced around a fair bit. You've been with your, uh, your wife, uh, for about eight years or a little over eight years. And yeah. you guys have been, uh, traveling a fair bit. I imagine due to your, uh, your football career. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. So the first 16 years I grew up in London and, uh, stayed in and around South London um, and then yeah through, through my football career moved all over the country moved to Wales moved to the south south of England north of England um, and yeah we're on I think I'm on to my 10th place so I moved out when I was about 17 so I'm about my 10th home um, but my eighth yeah eight well, I've been with my wife for eight years this is our eighth place um, but this is the one that we're hopefully going to settle in for, yeah, for yeah. quite a number of years so don't jinx it a, no, <laughs> we've got, we've got a, uh, our little girl's free this, this year. So oh, it's going to nice. be nice to hopefully give her a bit of stability being stability. in this area. Yeah. yeah. And so just the, the, the one uh, daughter at this point. Yep. Just the one yep. little girl. And she, nice. she came, she came along a month after I had to retire from football. So that oh, was hey. perfect time for me. Yeah. Perfect timing. Exactly. Now with the retirement question, was it, um, was it your choice or was it uh, like, did the retire? was it just sort of naturally time in your life to retire? How did that come about for you? No, it was, uh, it was actually very sudden. Um, and it, it, it links quite a bit to my, I'm sure we'll come on to in a mm. bit with, uh, mm -hmm. uh, with alcohol, but um, no, at the age of 28. So in, in oh, England, wow. usually, you know, you, your retirement age, if you've had a good career, usually about 35, 36. Right. Um, so I thought I had another, probably eight years in me um, yeah. and I was doing really well at the time um, funnily enough one of my biggest games was against Manchester City and that was on a on a Saturday evening and on the Tuesday I played a game in the league and had a cardiac sort of episode after the game um, taken to hospital uh, I stayed in for a, num a number of days and about a week actually and at the end of it, after all the tests, they, they discovered I had a heart condition, um, which deemed it unsafe for me to carry on competing at the level that I was. So literally within the space of a week or two of my the biggest game of my career, I had to, you know, cut it short. And and that was it. I retired at the age of 28 and it was pretty instant. So it was a it was something that was quite worrying at the time and I had a lot of uncertainty going into the future um my wife was seven or eight months pregnant at the time so there was wow. lots going on it was a, yeah. a hectic period and yeah it wasn't it wasn't the retirement that I'd hoped for but yeah now I see lots of positives from that but it's taken me a little while to get there I could yeah I could see that thanks for painting that picture that would be uh that's a tricky one to navigate it's like now like you see you can look back in hindsight and the timing of it especially right as your your girl is coming into the world from that side of things but man 28 is like you say that's like you're just getting going that's like your prime in a lot of ways i would assume right so the, i'm i imagine that would have been a very bitter pill for you to swallow especially to have it just you know go suddenly yeah. like that I, th I think i think when you retire from sport you want it to be on your terms um yeah. i think i think that's probably a, a big part of it and i've done quite a lot of research into retired athletes and retired um you know yeah athletes from different sports really um, and it does tend to be the ones that haven't retired on their terms that maybe find it a little more difficult. Yeah. Um, yeah. I could see that. Yeah. Well, that's uh, that's a good, um, good setting the table for, for what we'll speak about later. So um, yeah, that's, yeah, well, that'll be a, that's going to be a very engaging part of the conversation, but let's, let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to your, the, your early days, you know, growing up uh, close to, actually before one, I had one question cause you have moved around so quick. Uh, just a curiosity thing. What is your favorite place? that you've been to what's the what's your what's the, if i were to come over and go okay i gotta see one. i get to see one city or one town in that area what would it be Oof. I, I actually really like where i am now because i grew up in yeah. london in, in the city like in and around real hectic 
yeah it's, it's it is an unbelievable place you know in the there's there's something going on all the time yeah yeah but now because I've, I've always lived in pretty much centrally to cities and like big towns now I live a little bit further out and it's the first time I've ever been by the beach and by oh. sea and just very different so I appreciate that side probably a lot more than the people that have stayed in this area sure um, yeah. yeah so I'm I'm quite big on like cold water therapy and like nature and nice. so I go and get in the sea but people look at me around here like I'm crazy like because they, yeah <laughs> they've they've lived here all their life and they it's just used to it but for me it's quite it's quite new and exciting so I Absolutely. really like it here yeah. well and you've had like both sides of it right like London is this I, I would think it's like kind of the equivalent of like New York in, yeah. in the states right it's like or toronto in canada right it's it's like yeah. the number one city in a lot of ways so you go from that and now you're out in this area where you can enjoy nature like you say so you've seen both sides of the coin whereas folks that have grown up in that area yeah. may have a desire to have the opposite they're like oh, i want to go see the big city one day and you're like no nah, you know i'm <laughs> yeah. good i've seen it enough <laughs> yeah. I, yeah i still go back probably once a month so it's, oh, it's, it's yeah. good i, I enjoy yeah. dipping in and out but i really sure. like where i am now yeah yeah i like what you're saying yeah dip in and out that's probably that's perfect just a little bit a uh, little taste of it to remind you and you know there's some, i'm sure there's some nostalgia in there as well right for some oh, of these for sure. yeah for sure excellent so yeah let's go back to early days though like what was your earliest experiences with alcohol like just paint the picture was it does it run in your family was it you know friends of family gatherings you know that type of thing what was your first exposures and how did that look like you know getting into your teenage years even yeah it's probably um maybe starts off quite usual but then turns unusual so my my early upbringing is lots of family lots of friends lots of family parties which all included alcohol um, so I was around lots of drunk people from a very early age. Um, my dad, who I've not had a relationship with since I was probably seven or eight, um, mm. drank heavily, wasn't a very nice person when he had a drink. Um, so I've got lots of sort of bad early memories around alcohol. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> moving on from that, we, we moved in with my nan and granddad, um, my brother and sister and my mum. So we had quite a busy household, but there was never really much drinking going on at home, but there would be, you know, Christmas parties and family gatherings, stuff like that. But I had a sort of burning ambition to become a professional footballer from the age of five or six. So really early on. And when I was eight years old, I signed for Chelsea. Um, so a big academy, huge sort of organisation and a very sort of professional environment. So for me, wanting to become a professional footballer, I knew that to be the best athlete that I could, alcohol, you know, wasn't a good thing. Coaches sort of drummed it into us, you know, when you get to your teenage years, alcohol's bad for you. And then plus the experiences that I'd had with alcohol, I'd always had this massive negative sort of connotation around mm -hmm. it. So I, I remember, <clears throat> I remember having conversations and, you know, you get like real vivid memories of certain childhood, just, just strange little conversations, which are quite unusual to remember. But I remember saying to a couple of people when I was about nine or 10, like, are you going to drink when you're older? And they were like, yeah, I want to have a beer and stuff like that. And I was like, it's disgusting. I'll never drink. And I remember really vowing, like, I will never touch a drop of alcohol. <clears throat> and when I went to school, um, I went to an all boys school. And when you get to sort of 15, 14, 15, 16, my friends in school started experimenting with alcohol, but I had, again, zero desire. So I always stayed away from it. Um, if they invited me to parties, I rarely went because my weekends were, were taken up by football. Um, most of the nights of the week were taken up by football. So it was it was a huge commitment at that age. Um, and I didn't have time to go to parties, but I didn't feel like I was missing out on anything. I felt like I was... ...sixteen... I think your friends stop inviting you out um, to the party, to the park, to, to drink alcohol because there's only so many times that they're going to hear no. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think by the time I was 16 and I left school, um, my friends went one way and I went the other way and didn't really sort of speak to them um, after that. And my new friends became my football teammates that I went on to, to play with. But until until the age of my first drink was at the age of 19. So oh, wow. in this country in particular, very late. Yeah, I think a lot of 
a lot of my peers and a lot of people that I knew started drinking from probably 14 years old. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because I had a, a guest on last night and he's from uh, from the States and he seems to uh, to think or recall that it, like the legal drinking age in Europe is like, is it 14 or 16? It's a little bit younger than North America, is, is it not? Or is it just sort of more accepted? The, like you can... it, it is. It's 18. Oh, it is 18. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It is. Uh, yeah, it's 18. But it, like you say, like socially, it's pretty acceptable yeah. from the age of 16, I would say. Yeah. Because I have, yeah, I even have a friend that's from Italy. And he mentioned from like 14, like he was able to have wine with dinner and things of that nature. And he's like, yeah, it worked out well for him because he's like, I got it out of my system super early that like, you know, so by the time he was 18, moved to Canada he's like ah I've been there done that you know what I mean so it wasn't a big thing for him but <laughs> you know what? Now, now that you say that actually I think I think um I think it, it's 18 that it's um legal to buy alcohol mm. I think you can actually drink alcohol with a parent at oh, 16 okay that makes so yeah I that think makes that's I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure on that but I think that might be yeah. sounds familiar anyways yeah interesting so yeah that's yeah. an interesting start man like it sounds very focused straight and narrow like this is my goal from an early age i'm going to be a footballer nothing's going to get in my way to the point that you're you know leaving relationships with friends they're going that way you're like no this is my path and then your first drinks at 19 so yeah very uh you know not your usual uh starting mm -hmm. point as far as alcohol especially with your um almost a rejection to it as far as like seeing it in the context of your family going, I don't want a part of this. So, so yeah, what I, I'm curious, what, uh, what happened after, you know, age 19, when you start when you had your first drink, where, where did things go after that? So it was, um, I, I began going to sort of parties and, and social gatherings with uh, my teammates. So when I was probably 17, 18 and they would all drink, and they were, you know, young aspiring or prof young professional footballers as well. And um, they were all drinking, having a good time, talking to girls a lot more. They seemed a lot more confident. They could dance. They could have a good time. Yeah. And but wooden. And I felt quite awkward talking to girls. Um, I'd gone to an all boys school. Um, I'd then gone into an all male environment. So. I hadn't had any kind of experience of, of mixing with the opposite sex. And for me, it probably got to a point where I was like, these guys are able to go out to drink, to have a good time. And then they're able to perform on the pitch because some of them were, were better players than I was. Oh, so I was like, yeah. so I was like, if they can do it, then surely I can. And I feel like I'm missing out on. And it was almost a bit, yeah, a little bit of peer pressure, I would say, but had a couple of drinks at a party um, and I did, I did feel like I, I was more confident. I felt accepted into the group. I no longer, you know, I remember taking my first drink and everyone cheering mm. and, you know, because I, I kept rejecting it and it was like, Oh, we finally got him into the group and he's going to be yeah. one of us. And yeah. You had that feeling of, of acceptance. Um, yeah. But I remember, I remember the next morning sort of waking up with huge guilt because I remember that sort of, I was so adamant as a kid that I would never drink. So I remember I was like, oh, I've just broken that vow, you know, that I that would always, you know, never, never sort of sway and drink. And now I've done it. And I remember feeling really guilty the next day. And I would go for a run and try and sort of punish myself physically. Mm, yeah. So I've always, I did carry on drinking after that, but I was pretty sensible. Um, but I always, I always felt quite guilty the next day. Um, and I felt like a lot of my friends could go and drink. And they were absolutely fine the next day. They didn't have this shame or this guilt. But I, I felt that from a really early age. And that probably played into the complicated relationship I ended up having with alcohol. Certainly. Yeah. So you finding that yourself, yeah, you feel this guilt and there was this need to punish yourself, whether it's going for a run. And how did that make you feel after you would do the run? Did you feel like it, it kind of balanced itself out or was there still this kind of this feeling of guilt or dread that you would still would still remain i think i think the, the longer the time went on the less guilty i felt um sure but yeah i would i would probably feel better after i did a run and i was like right that's out of my system now or I'd yeah take loads of water and yeah. and i'd try and prepare myself for, for training but yeah i it wasn't all it was a an early sort of guilt and a just a, just an awkward relationship with alcohol because I felt 
I ended up feeling like I needed it in a social situation. I, I felt right. really shy. And particularly with girls. Um, but when I had a few drinks, I felt like I could talk to anyone. I felt like yeah. I could go and dance. I felt like I wasn't so self-conscious. But then equally, when I was in a sober situation, I felt even more nervous or even more mm. shy or even more sort of boring at times um so i ended up feeling like i need a drink to be this person so it was almost like twofold it would turn down your nor your sober personality even that bit more or it seemed like it did because on the other side of it you were like yeah you had this other almost this other like side of you the other thing that i found fascinating is like the celebration the feeling that you're like you're going to get left out of the tribe essentially if you don't drink and which is like it's i mean that's peer pressure right at the end of the day yeah. and you know and it's like yeah younger younger boys it's uh it's you know it, it is what it is right but but it's still it's like the fact that they celebrate you know and then all of a sudden you've responded in such a way that you've had this drink and they're every celebrating you're like oh, okay well this is you know it's pretty hard to to uh turn away from it at that point isn't it yeah yeah, yeah. i so. think I, th I think with it, like the more I drank in in those situations, the more confident the drunk version of me got. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The less confident the sober me got. Perfect. So it That's, was like yeah, and my personality was somewhere in the middle. Right. Uh, right. It was just just so inconsistent. Yeah. Yeah. No, you articulated perfectly. That's what I was. Uh, I was trying to get at. And like you say, you're somewhere I'm, in the I'm just middle. checking. I'm just checking. Sorry. Can you can you hear yeah. my connection? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Every now and then you cut out. I don't know how is it on your side. Like, do you Let am me, I cutting um, out a bit? Gonna, I'm gonna go to a different. Sure. Sorry, gonna... Are you able to edit this? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can. I generally don't uh, worry too much about editing, but I mean, in this case, okay. we've we're clearly, uh, you know, doing <laughs> something different with it. Um, yeah, That's you know what? Some... Generally speaking, like your your uh, video would freeze a little bit, but I could still hear what you were saying, so it, it's okay. uh, it wasn't a big deal. Um, yeah, what was I saying though? Um. Yeah. So, well, just interesting stuff though. Interesting to look back upon, like you say, it's a very awkward relationship. Jeff, that was the question I was going to ask you. Cause I feel like from my, my experience with alcohol, I felt like I had a split personality and it was kind of similar to you. I was a very shy kid. So I used it to, and very similar as well. Like I painfully shy around girls. I like, as soon as I talk to them, I go beat red. Right. So with the alcohol though, I was like, oh, okay, I could do this. Right. So I totally relate with that. And I, I felt like, especially towards the end, I had like a split personality. I had drunk me. I had like the, the sober me, but like you say, it's like, it's not quite the real me either because that's been amplified too. The shyness has been amplified. The insecurity has been amplified. So I definitely relate to what you're saying. Did you, uh, do you view it as that? It's almost like a split personality. Like oh, you have like yeah, two characters. Sure. Yeah. Interesting. And, uh, and, and actually when I, when I moved club, See when you when you move club you get you just get 20 25 new teammates that yeah you almost you almost have a chance to be a new character a new because person. no one knows you yeah and when i went to another team probably at the age of 20 21 when you go out as a team i was almost it sounds quite cheesy but i was almost seen as like a little bit of a ladies man when we go out because by that point i was quite confident on a night out once i'd had those drinks so i could go up to someone and and talk to someone or you know i'd be seen with a girl whatever it might be but and that's all that they would see but they wouldn't see that i could not date a girl sober i, I you know I, i'd arrange to meet up with them in the week go for a coffee whatever it might be and always pull out because i was like i can't go there if i'm not going to drink i won't be wow she's yeah. met this version of me right and i'm not going to be able to live up to that without the alcohol wow. so yeah yeah although some people saw me as sort of really really smooth with the girls yeah in like <laughs> yeah most of the time I, I really wasn't and it wasn't wow. it wasn't until yeah probably in my yeah. 20s that I, I was able to sort of overcome that a little bit and to jump ahead just so we can have a marker is where to stop when when did you meet your wife that you're uh like so I was almost 24 when I 24 her. okay so we got a little yeah. ways to, to get up to that point yeah. uh, that'll be an interesting story especially all the backstory that you've given up <laughs> to this point seeing how that goes Okay. So by this time, yeah, you're, you're a professional footballer. Like you say, every, almost every season, you're getting this chance to essentially reinvent yourself, uh, you know, with the new group of guys you're going out, uh, you're using this, uh, you know, this drink to, uh, 
to have this, so yeah, this essentially a second chance as far as like, okay, now I'm going to change my persona this way or that way. Um, yeah. When was it in your twenties that you, that it's sort of started to really affect you and turn on you? Like, it seems like you have some hesitations, but at the same token, you're getting these benefits from it, right? As far as, mm. yeah, you're, you're feeling more confident. You're talking to ladies, you're getting this, um, you know, championed by your, your football club as a, you know, a ladies man. And okay, this guy's yeah. Right. So you're getting the benefits or so you think, uh, when did it start to kind of really turn on you? What, uh, how old, and can you give us a little bit of backstory on that? So it probably, it was, it wasn't until quite a way down because, uh, mm. when I look back at my early, early drinking experiences, I was always still quite sensible. Um, so I would never sort of throw up or fall over or do anything really bad. And I had that off switch. So once I got to a certain point, I knew, right, that's me done for the night. I'll have a different drink. I'll have a water. I'll go home. And I rarely, if ever, went overboard. Mm. But the older, probably the older I got, the more, I think that guilt went away. I didn't feel as guilty anymore after having a drink. That sort of went away. Maybe I started drinking a little bit heavier, but still didn't feel at all out of control. Um, I think football and having to, you know, have that routine and that structure and be really fit and watch your diet and stuff like that kept me on a straight and narrow path. Mm. It wasn't until I retired that that sort of routine and that structure and that training just sort of went out the window a little bit. And it was, yeah, so it it was more, there were, there were some signs there. So maybe at the age of 25, 26, I probably did go overboard a little bit too much. Mm. So maybe I started, you know, saying things I regretted on a night out or when I'd had a drink or maybe getting into an argument with my wife when we'd never really do that when mm. I was sober. Yeah. Um, so there were, there were some signs there that I didn't really like. Um, and that would start to get like regrets of what I'd done when I had, a, when I'd had a drink, nothing too bad, but just, there was something, there was a little voice inside of me that was like, mm, I don't really like what I'm becoming when I have a drink. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's okay. Good. I, yeah. So we're kind of getting into your mid twenties there. So at this point you've met your wife, let's do a little story of like how, how you met your wife. How did you get over this, uh, you know, this fear of dating, uh, dating her specifically and how did the first day go with sober you like, or did she meet you sober? What is the whole story with, with your wife there? Uh, it probably it probably sums up the the shyness that I did have, and I'd, I'd overcome it a little bit now. But we met on um, on on actually Twitter, so we oh okay yeah. we we started messaging. So she sent me a message first, and we went back and forth. Um, and our first date was at a bar, lots of alcohol involved. Um, and I, I remember actually before going to the date, having I think. I had one or two drinks by myself before I went on the date Uh, because I was like, right, I want to, I want to be more confident. And that was back then at the age of 23, 24, that was my perception of what confidence was. And and looking back, it was like two, it was two ciders. So it was two sort of 4% drinks. So Mm. two of them wouldn't have a huge effect, but it had a placebo effect. Sure. So going there probably felt a little bit looser, more confident. Um, and yeah, we we had sort of a few cocktails that night and got on really well. And um, we actually went for <clears throat> we went for a drink, uh, like a coffee on the next one, I think it was. So she met me. I really liked her. So I was like, I have to show her the sober side of me because I want this to, to be a long term thing. I can't just drink, drink, drink all the time. Yeah, right. Um, and yeah, she made me feel really comfortable. Um, nice. Yeah. And yeah, it was the I'd had sort of on and off relationships before that but nothing serious nothing I'd ever Mm. sort of no girl I'd ever taken home to my mom yeah I'd only I'd only ever wanted to do that if it was going to be something serious and yeah yeah she was the first one that I you know introduced to my family and cool became sort of let my guard down a little bit yeah right on okay that's a cool story yeah I like that so it's more so like she can I think she I get the impression you know that she uh she was intuitive enough to kind of pick up on the fact that you're feeling a little bit uh you know, insecure or just shy and was able to sort of calm you and go and, and allow you to be yourself, your sober yeah. self, your true self. So yeah, it's uh, a cool story, man. That's awesome. And so you guys happily married eight years. 
sounds like there's uh you know obviously there has been some uh you know some rocky road here and there which of course we can get into now you know so yeah 25 26 you met her at 25 is that what you 24 24 okay yeah so you got another four years of um you know of, of professional uh, footballing and you're kind of you're having these feelings uh, these thoughts that you know it is starting to kind of turn on you uh where the guilt is removed but there's still a bit of like regrets the next day where you're like ah you know i said something i shouldn't have this kind of thing so it's kind of there's definitely a shift happening so what uh what was it looking like when before this game before let's let's fast forward a bit to unless you have something else you want to backtrack to to this like the biggest game of your career that ends up being what a incredibly pivotal time in your life and you know what forced you into retirement you give it let's let's speak a bit about that because that sounds like a, a a huge part of your story here in a lot of ways yeah um i think i think um my relationship with alcohol up to that point was maybe when i first started meet when i first met my wife she's a, a singer and a performer and lots of her friends are quite extrovert oh okay. and instead of me feeling conscious um about talking to girls because i was now with my wife it was quite awkward in being thrown into a social situation with lots of extroverted people and performers because mm. they were full of personality without alcohol but when they had alcohol as well they were even more so <laughs> it made me feel like yeah. really um I don't know just really quiet and shy but a lot of those a lot of those times I had to be sober in those environments because mm. I had training the next day oh, okay um but I always you know felt awkward but then if it was on a Saturday night and I had Sunday off I could drink alcohol so I, I dreaded the ones that were at any time apart from that mm. but if it was on a Saturday night I was like yes I can <laughs> I can be the you know yeah. the confident guy and have a laugh of everyone so yeah. it shifted there a little bit so it was still sort of present um you know that personality of needing a drink in certain situations but moving on to the the game it was a yeah a big game against Manchester City which was a you know a huge occasion for me that was on a Saturday and then on a Tuesday it was sort of back to the league game and I didn't feel very well before the game and I felt like I was coming down with sort of the flu or something like that um I played the game uh <clears throat> and I didn't feel great but I actually I'm a defender so I don't score many goals but I actually scored in that game oh it wow. gave me sort of a little bit more adrenaline maybe yeah um but it got to about 20 minutes before the end and I just sort of put my hand up and said I feel really breathless um mm. so my legs don't feel right um so I asked to come off and we were winning quite comfortably so it wasn't an issue for me to come off um and then I felt sort of quite lethargic afterwards got home um and it was the next day that I felt really like flu-like symptoms um you know when your body's like really warm but then you go shivering like cold soon after and yeah I took myself to bed um and just gradually throughout the night my heart my heartbeat just kept pounding and pounding and pounding mm. and it got to the point where and my wife was was seven months pregnant at the time so I didn't want to wake her up and yeah yeah sort of alarm her or anything like that but it got to the point where it literally felt like the, the bed was shaking through my heartbeat Wow. Um, and I remember waking her up and just said that you're going to have to take me to hospital here. I'm sh like I'm struggling to breathe. And I started to panic a little bit with, with my heart rate. Um, and I got to hospital and they took my heart rate and it was 200 and something sort of resting heart rate. Um, so they took me, sh took me straight through and, you know, said, this is serious. Um, and I don't remember much of that initial couple of hours. So it was, it was quite late at night. Um, they gave me some sort of painkillers and medication, <clears throat> put me on an IV drip. Um, and the next day I actually felt okay. So I came back around and felt pretty normal after that, but I had to be kept under observation. Um, and then, yeah, after sort of a, a week, a week of being on a cardiac unit. Um, and it was a, a strange one because it was a, the cardiology unit and I was in there and I was like a, like a fit young 28 year old athlete right and every other person in there was probably 70 years old 80 years old wow like had smoked all their life or sure. had like oxygen tanks and stuff like that yeah and I, I just remember being like why am I here with like all these guys like what what is going on um sure so I was quite confused by it um but yeah it got to the point where they they recognized that I had a, a heart 
condition um and i'm currently getting i currently get scanned every year wow yeah um originally it was every every few months and kept under quite close observation but at some point i'll need open heart surgery and um really a, a valve replacement but we're trying to sort of prolong that for as long as possible just to see yeah you know, there could be new technology, there could be new yeah. ways of doing things. So yeah, at the moment, I mean, it gets scanned because I'm sort of not on the severity stage where I need an operation right now. Gotcha. But, you know, when when things go that way and it's looking probably like three years possibly, um, mm. I'll need sort of open heart surgery and a new valve. But an interesting part about that is I... They, so originally it was just <clears throat> we feel like you can manage this if you stop playing football you may not need surgery mm. so i didn't know that i needed surgery but i knew that i needed to retire from football right and i, I will come on to like my, my drinking after this but yeah yeah probably about 18 months after after that i went to a hospital appointment and they said look you are going to need you're 100 percent going to need this surgery in the near future and my first question was does that mean I won't be able to drink afterwards mm. and that's when I, I came away from that and I was like why mm. is that my first why is that my first thought yeah and I hadn't recognized at this point I had an issue with alcohol but I knew someone that had had this operation and they were on um blood thinning medication afterwards yeah and they they weren't allowed to drink alcohol because of the the spiking of the levels in your blood yeah so when they when I was told it my first response and I remember the very first thing it wasn't like you know, what does this mean for my life? What does this mean yeah. in terms of the operation? The yeah. first thing was, does this mean I have to give up alcohol? Wow. And yeah. Looking back, I was like, wow, that is not a healthy thing for, for me to say as a first question. <laughs> sure. <clears throat> wow. That, so that was um, just one of those moments of realizations, right? Where yeah. you're just like, it's almost like it's so reactionary for you to say it. And then you're like, wow. Yeah. And, even, and even then, even then they said to me, yeah, it does mean that you have to stop drinking. Yeah. Um, and I've got a message on my phone that I sent one of my best friends afterwards. And I said, oh, you know, they've said that I'll possibly need this operation in the next one to three years and I won't be able to drink afterwards. And my message to him was, that means we're going to have to get as much in as possible from now until then. Oh, like, yeah. It was like, let's get as many like good times in as we can before then. And my, it's, yeah, it's, I obviously think so differently now, but my association with a good time was we have to have alcohol involved. Yeah. And um, yeah, I'm, just, I'm glad that my relationship's completely changed with that now. No kidding. Yeah, that's a, quite a story. There's a lot to talk about. I want to, uh, you know, as we get to closer to the end, I want to circle back to certain, um, uh, you know, thoughts and emotions that you had about, you know, the forced retirement and such. In fact, that could be, you know, a whole other episode, really. And, you know, and get into that. But um just to stay on the path of, of, you know, the, the subject at hand with the alcohol and all that. So what did it, when you came out of the hospital, uh, you got your forced retirement here. I've sent a message to your buddy. Is that sort of how you conducted uh, yourself after that? And from that time period, when was the definitive get okay, boom, that is it. I am done. I am now sober. What, uh, what does that time period look like for you? Yeah. I think that, that conversation with my friend was probably 18 months after I initially retired. So oh, okay. um, yep. that was when I was told that I'll need the operation, but originally right. it was just stop playing football. We'll get you regularly, regularly checked and keep it um, sort of under observation. Right. But when I, so when I first stopped playing football, I'd never, I'd never had alcohol at home. So mm. I never just, the only time I drank was to go out and drink it. It'd never yep. been like a few beers in the fridge. Um, but when I retired from football, I was like, oh, I can actually do this now. Like I can mm. be like a normal guy and have just like a bottle of wine at home or a couple of beers. And when I'd stopped playing football, um, immediately afterwards, I was very anxious, nervous about the future because I'd only ever earned money playing football. I totally. didn't really, I wasn't really prepared for ending that career. Didn't know what I was going to do afterwards. And I'd try and keep myself really busy during the day, try and do as much as I can, network with people. I uh, went to university, I did different courses, but in the evenings, I'd sit on the sofa and constantly overthink, overanalyze, worry. But if I had three, four beers, it eased. So it mm. sort of took me out of that zone, took me away from overthinking, overanalyzing, and put me in like a calm state or so I thought. 
And I felt okay doing that at the time. And then those four or five beers turned into sort of six or seven beers. And my wife's, you know, real, real support is really good for me. Um, and if I had more than three, maybe she, she wouldn't, you know, moan at me or anything, but she'd ask a question. She'd say like, do you need, why are you drinking? Like, do you need one mm. more? Or, mm -hmm. you know, a little girl's gone to bed and she's like, why, why are you drinking five or six beers just when we're sat at home? Like, you're not, you're mm. not doing anything. And mm. It annoyed me at the time because I was I knew that it was wrong so I knew that in my head I was like she's right but I, I enjoy doing this this is the one thing that I, I wanted to do at the moment right so I if I had two or three she wouldn't really say anything she'd be like okay that's fine but if I had any more than that she would so I began hiding alcohol so mm. I would hide I'd hide them around the house yeah places so she only knew that I was drinking two or three right when actually I was having six seven maybe yeah. or she'd go to bed I just I'd, I'd almost crave that times as bad as it sounds so I could just be on my own and drink I yeah. really craved being on my own yeah and if I if I worked away at a hotel I really enjoyed just sitting in a room going to a shop getting lots of drink and just almost blacking out and it's it's just crazy to say now but just sitting there on my own drinking as much as I possibly could without anyone telling me that I couldn't or questioning right. me yeah um and it got to got to a point where on social occasions I was becoming a bit of a liability even at like family barbecues I'd be falling over and mm. when I, uh, people that had known me as being really sensible were starting to see me you know be a bit louder and be a bit looser and doing things that I didn't usually do um and yeah, it probably got to a point where I, 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 deep down, I knew that I had some kind of issue. And I remember Googling, you know, what is an alcoholic? Um, mm. You know, mm. do I have an, you know, trying to find out. Because my, my, it, for me, it was either you're either an alcoholic or you're not. And there's right. no sort of in between. And yeah. if I don't drink every day, then I can't be an alcoholic. Or if I can sometimes just have two and then stop. But most of the time it was once I'd had one, there was no off button. So right. even going out with friends, they would go home and get the train home or the bus home. I'd be going to the shop, buying alcohol for the journey home when, mm. you know, everything's sort of finishing. I had no sort of stop button in me. And it got to a point um, probably about a year ago now, um, or just over a year ago where I said to my wife, my mum, who are the two closest people, I just said, I feel like I've got, an, an issue and you know since I've come out of football I feel very lost um I'm, I'm you know worried I'm concerned I'm anxious you know I feel like I've lost a lot of my purpose and my identity kind of thing um I was in a real sort of mixed place and had some sort of dark thoughts and um I just said to them you know I've been hiding alcohol from you um I feel like I've got an issue and uh, just spilled everything really to them um and I stopped drinking and I got help. Uh, I went and saw a counsellor and sort of that, that helped initially. And about two or three weeks after that, I thought, right, now I'm cured. So mm. I've learned my lesson yeah. and I can now moderate. So I'll set myself a two, uh, I'll set myself a three drink rule. So whenever I go out, I'll, I'll allow myself to have three drinks and then stop. And that lasted about two weeks. Yeah. Um, got to, got to a stage where I went up a couple of friends and, probably had three drinks in the first hour and someone bought me another one I was like all right just this once I'll have one more and that yeah. night ended up being a bit messy and you know I got drunk and came home late that kind of thing mm. and that was actually the last time I ever drank um because I, I, I was really disappointed in myself after sort of opening up and address it or acknowledging that I had an issue with alcohol and then went back to it right I saw how disappointed my wife was and then actually the, the morning after I was, I was sort of hung over um, and I went for a drive a couple of hours later and I listened to a podcast um, and just like sort of coincidentally came across it. And it was a former cricket player um, and I'm not a cricket fan, but he he spoke um, about retiring from cricket and his alcohol issues. And it was literally mm. as if someone was telling my story for me. Wow. Um, yeah. And it was just the perfect thing for me to listen to at that point where I was yeah. most vulnerable totally. um, and that 
that to me um, just shows the power of sort of identifying with someone else, yeah. the power of community and especially in this alcohol free and sobriety community, just having a group of people that have been through something really similar to you and knowing that you're not the only one that feels a certain way. Um, and almost having other people that can help you through certain situations. And yeah, yeah I, I haven't drunk. Um, and you know, since that point and initially it was difficult. Um, I had a lot of cravings for it. So those evenings where I sat there and I drank, I all of a sudden had that time on my hands. I had those thoughts in my head. I had, and I didn't know what to do with them. Um, mm. I think I probably ate loads of chocolate initially. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I replaced it with that. But yeah, exactly. Once I once I got to a certain point, probably around three or four months of of not drinking, it was as if a light bulb went off, and I just saw all these huge benefits. And I saw that sober, nervous, shy sort of version of myself the, the true version of myself started to come out of the comfort zone a little bit and started to speak to people and become a bit more confident because mm. once you go into a situation and the sober me has you know dealt with a, a social event or dealt with a conversation and it's gone really well all of a sudden it's it's a little boost and it's like oh actually I, I can do this sober I can go to a wedding sober I can go and meet friends sober I can go to a networking event sober. I can speak to people. I can dance possibly like all these things that I thought I couldn't do without alcohol. Mm. I started sort of ticking off yeah. and it's just, it's just been a, an absolute life changer. And probably about four or five months in is when I started really researching alcohol, alcohol free, um, mm opening up a little bit more on social media yeah um, opening up with friends and being really comfortable talking about it and I've just found such power in the the online community and it's um it's something I had no idea existed um right this time last year no idea and I just love listening to different people's stories and and seeing their experiences and I feel like I've got a purpose back um yeah. you know, with this and I get yeah. through the some of the things that I, I share I'm now getting sort of especially young men and former athletes that are resonating with things I'm saying and being able to to help people and being able to sort of feel needed and feel you know that purpose back has been you know a real life changer for me it's amazing what a story man so and what how long are you uh like what's your uh your sober birthday or what is your uh sober it'll, idea be, up to? it'll be a year on the 30th of July so Ooh, um, coming up yeah coming up to it yes congratulations but, but I, I, i'm yeah I'm, I'm i'm really well aware that i'm really new into this journey i'm really you know it's for me it seems like a long long time but yeah you know, it isn't it isn't in comparison to well i suppose it is a long time but it is yeah i, I understand that i'm still really new to this journey and this lifestyle so yeah uh, in your rookie year if you want to use like yeah, yeah sporting how, how term, you? Eh? uh you know i just i just had my three year uh, on oh, April wow. 9th. So a little over oh, three congrats. years. Thanks, man. Yeah. I had done a three years, uh, back in 2012 to 2015 and similar to you, I was like, I'm cured. I'm good now. And yeah. I tried to do the moderation thing. So I really resonate with what you're saying. I was like, oh, wow. I did everything, man. I'm like, I'll just drink on weekends. Then all of a sudden, every weekend's a long weekend. I'm like, I'll only drink when I go out. I started going out every night, you know, <laughs> everything that I, every rule that I tried to put in to moderate myself, I would just, it didn't, it yeah. didn't hold. And I was like, okay, I can't, I can't do this. I'll, clearly I cannot moderate. I am not cured. So, you know, and then the whole story after that, but yeah, so I, I'm, uh, yeah, the, coming up on my longest sobriety streak. Now I got a couple more months and all have broken that record from, uh, from previous. So, you know, I, I know some people say don't count days, but like, I think for guys like you and myself, like you're, I'm sure you're a bit of a stats guy being a sports guy. It's good to have like, you know, uh, X yeah, amount of days in, numbers, you know right? And in those early months every time it got to the 30th of the month yes it was like yes it was another like, one right done another and the first month was a long long month and then sure sure like right can i get to three months can i get to six months right can i get to and it, it is it's like target motivating right? yeah and um, exactly. and yeah i think once you got once i got to maybe four months i was like i have to do a year and then when i got to six months it was like there's no way that i'm i'm going to a year and then gonna and drink just, again like i've yeah. seen all these benefits now there's no way of going back and yeah. once i started sharing more online um 
I almost did it to make myself accountable as well. Yeah. Because yep. if I have, if sobriety becomes part of my identity and a part, big part of me and people know me for not drinking and I can share some of the benefits of, of what it's done for me, then I'm far less likely for any one of my friends to try and make me drink or try and encourage me to drink. They all yep. know now, like they know my issues. I've yep. been very open. So they're never going to say, go on, have one. It won't hurt. Yeah. So yeah. that alleviated that problem, but it also makes me, you know, I'm like, how can I drink? I'm the, I'm the guy that, you know, is, is not preaching about sobriety, but just like sharing yeah. my journey of it. Yeah. I'm never, uh, that doesn't mean that I'm, it, it means I'm far, far less likely to <clears throat> ever want to drink. So it just made me more accountable. But as I say, probably when I got to six months, it was like a light bulb went off and it was like, why, you know, why would I ever go back to drinking that after yeah. this? It's kind of like you reach that threshold where you are enjoying being sober and that's overtaken the, yeah. you know, enjoyment or the, you know, the, the fear of missing out from drinking. It's like, it's, it's overwhelmed the, uh, the need to drink, which is a great spot to be in. Right. Yeah. So congrats, dude. Great story. I would love to, are you interested in coming back for a part two? I want to get a little bit further, oh, sure. deeper dive into, uh, you know, the forced retirement thing there. I think there's a full other episode in there that a lot of people resonate with, like to you, specifically what you're mentioning is that you got some, uh, some athletes that are coming up to you and having this sort of thing. So to me, you know, obviously we, we touched on it and it was, you know, you, you had a good, uh, whatever it was five, seven minutes to, but I, I think we could, uh, easily do a full episode on it and just really get into like the emotions that came up, uh, and, and coupling that with the, the drinking that came out of it as well. I, I, I would love to have you back on if you're interested. No, no, for sure. It's been, it's been awesome. really enjoyable talking to you. Love it, man. Sounds good. Uh, and where can anybody find you online? I will link your, uh, your, uh, Instagram, which you do have the, uh, the verified check Mark. So yeah, <laughs> we know it's you. And, uh, so I'll link that. Is there anything else? Like, do you have, um, do you have any other, uh, you know, websites or anything online you'd like to share with the folks? Uh, I'm, I'm on, um, I've, I've just started sharing. I've just started, I found a real sort of passion in, um, <clears throat> in writing. So I started nice. trying to write more and write more blogs and documents and stuff so cool i do have a, a website which is very new it's called a sip of sobriety um a sip of sobriety.com um, and i've started sharing very recently just some blogs and going to start maybe documenting some of my experiences along the way and trying to trying to help people along the way with that i love it and it looks like you have a link to that in your instagram as well it looks like it's in part of your yeah. like your story there so and i'll link that in the show notes as well Dude, thank you so much for coming on and congratulations. Very, very inspiring story. And I'm very much looking forward to this part two. I, I have so many, just uh, so many questions already that I, I think it's going to be a very riveting and uh, helpful episode for a lot of folks. So I really appreciate you taking the time today, my friend. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. Absolutely. That.